Very good afternoon to everyone. First of all, I would like to thank everyone for your participation in this World uh, Met Met Metrology Celebration Day. In this particular case, we'll begin with the uh, room related to chemistry and metrology and then medical diagnosis. We have four speakers today, international and national speakers that will talk related to the contributions of metrology in clinical diagnosis. To begin this talk, we begin with a presentation by Dr. Megan Cleveland, PhD. She's a biologist and researcher in the genetic, applied genetics at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST in the US. And as her profile, she's a biologist. She has a title or her PhD in human genetics and molecular uh, in John Hopkins universities. She currently works in NIST and she has developed clinical standards related with techniques and genetical tests and assays like the digital PCR and other next generation tests. She has also worked in a consortium known as Genome in a Bottle, which seeks to identify different results so that this is related with a reference. Up next, we will uh, talk about bioscience. So this presentation is going to be done via video that she sent us earlier. So let's project the video. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Megan Cleveland, um, and I'd like to thank John for asking me to speak today. I'm a biologist at NIST, and my talk is going to be on the measurement infrastructure that NIST has to support health and bioscience. So first, just to give you an outline of my talk, I'm going to give some brief background on NIST. I'm going to talk about the importance of standards, and then I'll give specific examples of some of NIST's consortia and standards. And then finally, I'll have some conclusions. So first, some background on NIST. NIST is the National Measurement Institute for the United States. We have over 3,400 federal employees, as well as 3,500 associates. We have two main locations of our campuses. So there's the Boulder, Colorado location, and then there's the Gaithersburg, Maryland location. I'm based at the Gaithersburg, Maryland location, which is about 40 minutes outside of Washington, D.C. So how does NIST work with communities to meet needs? We can work with communities in a variety of ways. We can have one-on-one -on -one collaborations with people in academia, with other government organizations um, in the U.S., such as the NIH or the FDA, um, also with other government organizations in other countries, such as other metrology institutes. We can also work directly with industry. And we can have NIST-led consortia, which bring together members from academia, industry, and government. Uh, we also closely coordinate with other um, international measurement institutes and organizations, such as ISO. So now I just want to talk briefly about the importance of standards. So why, why do we need standards and why are they helpful? So standards help us to develop accurate methods of analysis. They allow us to calibrate measurement systems to facilitate the exchange of goods, institute quality control, determine performance characteristics, and to measure a property at a state-of-the-art limit. Standards also help us to ensure the long-term adequacy and integrity of measurement quality assurance programs. So what is a reference material? Reference material is a generic term, and a reference material is just a material that is sufficiently homogeneous and stable with respect to one or more specified properties, which has been established to be fit for its intended use in a measurement process. And the properties of a reference material can be either quantitative or qualitative. 
that is, you could have a reference material for the identity of a substance or a species, which doesn't have a numeric value attached to it. So now some examples of NIST consortia and standards. So we have about 1,100 reference materials at NIST, and most of these reference materials are in the physical and chemical sciences. But we have about 40 reference materials which relate to medicine and biology. So we have a reference material for cancer measurements. We also have a monoclonal antibody material, which I'll talk about more in a minute. We have a human DNA quantitation standard, which is used for forensic work. We have a DNA sequence library for external RNA controls, and we have the genome in a bottle materials, which allow for assessment of next generation sequencing technologies. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. So some more on the genome in a bottle consortium. So the NIST genome in a bottle consortium, it's a public private academic consortium, which helps to develop the technical infrastructure to enable translation of whole human genome sequencing to clinical practice. So the impact of this is that it builds confidence in the accuracy of next generation sequencing and enables the development of new capabilities for next generation sequencing. Some partners that have been involved with this include the FDA, the CDC, the NIH, as well as the sequence instrument providers, clinical labs, and academic sequencing centers. Uh, what genome in a bottle is composed of is that um, there are several cell lines for seven different human genomes, and NIST had, uh, for each of these cell lines, NIST had ATCC grow up a large batch of cells, and then to extract and homogenize the DNA from that batch of cells, and then aliquot it into tubes. So each tube is a homogeneous mixture of um, you know, DNA from that cell line. So it was the same passage, the same everything. And that uh, DNA is bottled into tubes and then, you know, it was sequenced at NIST, but it's also been sequenced at many other um, labs around the country and around the world. And the data from that is put online. So when you buy the physical material from NIST, you get that material, but also the da data is freely available to anyone online. So the data from the sequencing is used to come up with a benchmark uh, genome sequence. Um, and so these, these uh, materials have been sequenced by you know, many different methods and the benchmark data basically represents the best of all the methods. And so the way it works is that users have the genome in a bottle uh, samples, they run the samples on their you know, novel technology, their new platform, and compare that to the benchmark uh, genome in a bottle data. So occasionally, sometimes the data disagree, and uh, you know, that can either be the fault of the method the user is using, or it can be something with the benchmark data. And in the case that um, it could be the fault of the benchmark data, the genome in a bottle, uh, you, can, you can contact the genome in a bottle team and provide feedback on your you know, discordant results. And they will look at the uh, sequencing and see if it appears to be um, incorrect on the genome in a bottle side or the, the other side. And if it is something that is uh, incorrect on the genome in a bottle side, or it, it could also be just a new technology. So for example, there are many um, long read technologies now that weren't available when the genome in a bottle materials first came out. But in any case, this gets integrated into the next set of benchmark data. And then the cycle continues and the genome in a bottle samples improve and improve. Even though the actual physical material in the tube is the same, it's the bioinformatic data that's constantly being improved and expanded to include you know, more difficult regions. So the other thing about the genome in a bottle data is especially for the later cell lines from the Ashkenazi trio and the Chinese trio is that these were chosen from personal genome project cell lines, which are broadly consented cell lines. And so these can be used to make products and companies have generated over 30 products now 
which are based on the, um, the genome in a bottle samples. So they, these products include things like putting the cells in a clinical matrix, um, spiking uh, circulating tumor variants into the cells, um, into, into cells, and um, also creating clinical variants, somatic variants, and uh, difficult variants with these um, cell DNA as a background. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is the NIST MAB reference material. So the NIST MAB is a monoclonal antibody reference material. Um, and NIST obtained a large volume of a monoclonal antibody from a biopharmaceutical company. Um, but, uh, monoclonal antibodies are used in a lot of medicine these days. And um, there are many different techniques to analyze these monoclonal antibodies. This particular antibody um, is a, a humanized antibody that's expressed in a murine suspension culture. And it's intended for evaluating the performance of methods to determine the biophysical attributes of monoclonal antibodies. It's intended to be a representative test molecule that can be sent to all the different labs, but it doesn't um, require um, biopharmaceutical companies to test their own monoclonal antibodies or to send their monoclonal antibody to a competitor. They can all have this material and they can perform their different analyses on that uh, material without, um, you know, risking their intellectual property. So, as I said, it allows you to assess the variability between labs and between technologies. Um, and it fosters collaboration across the biopharmaceutical company. So some of the uh, methods that people have done so far are um, 2D NMR, glycoanalysis, HDXMS, um, and there's also a multi-attribute method consortium. So this has led to so far three books and over 88 peer reviewed journal articles. So finally, I'll talk about our SARS-CoV-2 research grade test material. So, um, you know, NIST, as with all the other institutions, wanted to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so now I'm gonna talk about our research grade test material that we made for the COVID-19 pandemic, um, RGTM 10169. So this material that I'm gonna talk about is available at new request. At, at no charge, sorry, and um, we've received and sent out about 160 units so far. We don't even charge for shipping of the material, but we just request feedback on the material. So, the and you may already be familiar with this, but the basic way that nucleic acid tests for SARS-CoV-2 work is that the, the patient is swabbed, the RNA is extracted and isolated, and then the first step is that the RNA is transcribed to um, reverse transcribed to DNA. So this is where the RGTM can come in because it's a, an RNA material. It doesn't uh, control for any of the extraction efficiencies or inefficiencies, but it does control for the step once you start converting the RNA to the DNA. And then of course the next step is that it's amplified and you get a result positive or negative. So we designed this material the construct in late March of 2020. And at that time, the vast majority of um, the assays were here where we designed construct one. And there were also some assays in this construct two region. And um, so we needed a small enough uh, amount that we could get it into a plasmid so that we selected those two regions, which are about four KB each. So we paid a company to synthesize a DNA fragment to clone this material into a vector, and then they return the vector to us. We used PCR to amplify the DNA region of interest from the vector, and then we performed um, RNA transcription to, to get RNA from that DNA. That RNA was then subsequently purified, diluted, and bottled, and, and sent out as the RGTM. We checked the fragments, to make sure that they were the correct size. We checked them on the bioanalyzer and on the flash gel. 
to come up with the copy number concentration for the material, we used a method called digital PCR. If you're familiar with qPCR, digital PCR works in a very similar way. Um, basically, you have your qPCR reaction with all your with your template DNA and your you know polymerase and all your free nucleotides, your primers, your probes, and that material gets fractionated into thousands of tiny droplets. And then at the end, depending on um, the number of positive and negative droplets you have, if you know the um, droplet volume, you can back calculate the starting concentration. And so this is a method that we've used previously for our viral reference materials that we've made for other things. And so we used it here for our COVID-19 um, reference material. So when you do digital PCR, this is just an example of the, um, the positive droplets here in blue or the negative droplets here in gray. And so you can get some shifting up and down between different assays, but generally the assays um, agree. Um, and so normally when we make a reference material, we provide one value for the reference material. So we have a team of statisticians, you know, we have 10 assays and we give all the results from all the assays to the statistician and the statistician will come up with one value with a specified uncertainty. But because this is a research grade test material and not an official SRM or RM from NIST, what we did was we just ran all the assays that were available at that time and then provided the um, exact number that we got in copies per microliter from that assay. And we didn't give any opinion as to which one we thought was the most correct or the least correct. We just used the publicly available assays at that time and provided the values for each. So um, this is the web page for our material. So if you're interested in the material, you can um, you know, go to this website here. You can also Google you know, NIST RGTM 10169 and it should come up. Um, and as I said, there's a form um, and you know, we're, we're happy to send you a unit free of charge. We just ask for some feedback about um, you know, what you did with the material and, and things like that. So just some brief, um, maybe interesting information on the material. This is a map of all the countries so far where RGTM 10169 has been sent. Uh, most of our requests are domestic requests. About 60% of the requests are domestic, but we also get about 40% foreign requests. Um, and so you could see here for the foreign requests, the top requesters are Germany, Canada, Austria, the UK, and Italy. But shown here at the bottom are all the different countries that the RGTM has been sent to. So I think it's um, at the time of this, it was about 24 countries, uh, not including the US, of course. So um, as I mentioned, we do ask people how they're using the material. And um, the majority of people are using it either for assay validation or for a new assay development. Some of the people are using it for assigning or confirming a concentration of another material. So basically they're using this material to set up a qPCR curve. One commercial stakeholder uh, used trace chemical analysis, GCIMS, to characterize the material and set up a detection algorithm for specific bases of the RNA fragments. We had another stakeholder who used the RGTM in a study involving the testing and preservation of fecal samples and also the extraction of viral RNA from these fecal samples. And then finally, uh, the Colombian NMI uh, used dilutions of the RGTM in a national proficiency test. Um, and we actually were very interested in the data from them because we had the material stored at minus 80 degrees Celsius. And normally when we have a material, we um, you know, test it at different temperatures and find the right temperature. But because we were trying to get this material out in such a quick way, we just um, kept it at minus 80 and we didn't test any lower temperatures to see if it was stable at minus 20 or to see if it was stable at four or room temperature. We just went ahead and said, you know, it's stable at minus 80, 
please keep the material at minus 80. But um, the um, INMC actually was able to test the material dilutions of the material at 4 degrees and found that the material was reasonably stable for 4 degrees. So that was very uh, helpful information for us to get back. So finally, um, in conclusion, you know, I just want to get across the point that NIST is the National Measurement Institute for the United States. And we work with stakeholders in a variety of ways. Like I mentioned, we can either make reference materials that are available to all the different stakeholders. We can do one on one collaborations or if there's wide enough interest, we can do these large consortia where we bring in um, experts from industry, from academia, from people at NIST, from people in other places in the government, um, and we all work together that way. We have over 1,100 reference materials. About you know 40 or so of these are biological materials, but the number of biological materials is increasing um, as the years go on, and um, we have more of a bioeconomy. And um, just overall reference materials can increase innovation. So finally, I want to thank um, everybody at NIST who worked with me on the RGTM product. So everybody in the applied genetics group and also the people from the genome and a bottle group, uh, Nate Olson in particular, did some um, sequencing data analysis for the RGTM. John Scheel is the person, the main contact for the NISMAB. So definitely, if you have any con if you have any questions about the genome in a bottle that I spoke about, um, please contact Justin. If you have questions about the NISMAB, please contact John. Um, I also want to thank everybody um, in the Office of Reference Materials and also our Public Affairs Office um, who helped get the word out about the RGTM. Uh, the people at um, NML at LGC. Um, Jim Huggett, Allison, Eloise, Alex, Denise, they provided us um, with uh, their protocol for producing RNA transcripts. And we used that, um, again, because we were short on time, so we didn't optimize protocols as much as we would normally have liked to. Um, so thank you to everyone, and uh, thank you for letting me speak today. Thank you very much. I wanted to thank Megan for sending us this video and for having participated in our conference today. Thank you very much, Megan, for showing us how the National uh, Institute of Standards and Technology in the U.S. has actually faced or has generated different standards to respond to different problems. And this is reflected in the COVID-19 pandemic where they generated reference material, which we as the National Columbian Institute, we can actually use this as well. And it really has been helpful in developing internal projects within the Institute. And later on, we'll share those. Continuing with our presentation today, we're gonna to continue with our speaker, Professor Maria Elena Ramirez. She is a professor from the biology department in the National University in Colombia. She's the director of the research and lab group in biochemistry from the National University of Colombia. She's a biologist as well. She has a master's in biochemistry from the National University in Colombia and her PhD studies have been in natural sciences from Fay University in Berlin. And currently she has worked in her research group with parasites that affect human beings like farciparo, which is the malarian agent. And she's also worked with other parasites like as intestinal parasites, which is considered as one of the pathogens that causes diarrhea in human beings. And at the same time, she's worked with these parasites and developed tools for producing different recombinant proteins and monoclonal antibodies in her area of investigations, biochemists, molecular biology and cellular biology. And she's very interested in parasites that can affect human and animal health apart from biotechnology applications. The talk that professor is gonna give us today is titled Reducing the Cost of Investigation Research in Colombia, a lab point of view. So let's go on to professor uh, Maria so she can show us her presentation. Andres, thank you very much. Unfortunately, I'm not allowed to share my screen right now. 
Okay, let's enable it for you. Give me one second. Can you see my screen now? Not yet, Professor. Not on the screen. Okay, let me re-attempt this. Give me a second. Uh, yes, yes, Professor. We see your screen. Okay, perfect. So good afternoon to everyone. Thank you very much for this invitation. And thank you very much for the opportunity to share with all of you certain reflections that have come about from our lab. First of all, I would like to organize this talk into three different sections. One first section related to give you some context related to what we do in our lab. A second part related to the potentials that we have in our lab. And finally, I wanted to close with an invitation or certain reflections for those that are listening. Very well. The research laboratory, Libic, Andres actually gave a brief overview at the beginning referencing our lab. It's actually a group of researchers that has been around for over 30 years now. The founder was Professor Moisel Basserman. And in all, during all of this time, it has actually trained many professionals and has been very active at the national university level and I think throughout the whole country. Well, our group, the truth is, is focused on the study of protozoa parasites that have a high degree of affectations on public health for, for things like Leishmania, the causes of Leishmaniasis, Tripasoma cruzi, which has the plasmodium falciparum for malaria, all of these intracellular protozoa parasites. And all we also work with the study of extracellular uh, parasites like Giarga deutalamus. I don't have the last photograph here. Some of you may ask yourselves, why study so many models? Because why not focus simply on one model and go more into depth than on one model in detail? Well, I can tell you that our group is part of a group of university researchers and our vision is training really and education that's one thing and we also have limitations in, uh, in resources and limitations in the budget dedicated to research and development therefore we have to try to find the best way to optimize the use of all of our resources the holisticness the cross-cutting study of models different models not only allows us to be able to actually uh, group together or train more students in these sciences and these investigation research processes but likewise they also help us to control development of the activities that we're actually undertaking when we actually name a reactant as you know in molecular uh, biology they these reactants have a lot of high cost and the fact that we can actually use this and use it completely and not dedicated simply to just a few experiments, but rather using it in different experiments and different projects, it allows us to optimize resources. So that's another reason why I justify and say why we work with different modules and different models. On the other hand, our group has focused on trying to identify in one way or another in a rational fashion certain uh, different therapy, uh, therapeutic uh, adverse. And I say rational because we do this based on the knowledge and the biochemical studies that we undertake and molecular studies that we do for parasites. What better way to actually overcome an enemy than by knowing what their strategies are? That's why our approximation is to study it, to, to get to know it. And based on the differences that this parasite presents with humans or the host, then we can actually rationally propose what the design is going to be like for the strategies. Our group has developed different research lines here, just to mention a few. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but we have worked on research in biochemistry and biology of parasites, the biochemistry of adaptive processes and the metabolism of energy of parasites. And here I wanna talk about the last one. I'm not gonna talk a lot about biochemistry, but this is just an example that I'm gonna develop in this context. In the last 10 years, 
we have developed research about the energy metabolism of parasites. And here, when we talk about energy, we can talk about cellular finances. And this is specifically, you can, be, you can see that we talk about the characterizations of the energy metabolism of NAD+. Plus. Some of you may not know it. I hope not, though. I, NAD is adenine and... It's an analog and similar to ATP, the energy molecule at the cellular level. And that is like maybe a currency. It's like energy currency. The levels of NAD define in all the cells that have been identified, whether they're very simple cells like prokaryotes and very complex cells or very complex organisms, that is always there. That availability, those those cellular currencies determine how the cell is going to work, what cellular processes they have in their surroundings. So that's why if we actually understand what the finance of this parasite is, if we understand how they acquire their resources, then we can find a way to control or attack it. Here we also see the dinocleotide of adenine and nicotinamide. NAD. For a long time now, we thought that we were only involved in the energy metabolism, but that is very, very important. Obviously, this is a pillar of cellular functioning. Likewise, as a precursor for NAD uh, is a neutralizer, which is essential in free radical mechanisms. Very recently, or not so recent, just about 20 years ago, we've observed that likewise, we have the participation as a substrate in the modification of proteins. So, and that modification of proteins regulates certain processes which are very important at a cellular level, like aging, like the rhythm, the circadian rhythm uh, regulation, the silencing of certain genes, the cellular progression, right? Reparation of DNA and apoptosis. Likewise, and the most innovative thing is that that molecule, this energy molecule initially, as the introduction said, can also be the precursor to signal molecules for a second messenger that is going to be involved in the activation and the cascading signs. Look at this. It's true that this has been the center or the focus of the research related to metabolism or energy metabolism and parasites. Having studied this and don't get scared because I'm not gonna go into uh, metabolical routes. We have focused and I consider that we are pioneers in actually revealing how you synthesize, how you actually use NAD at a molecular level in these parasites. And that way, if you actually observe here in the central portion, we see in a green on a green box an enzyme. That enzyme is clear. It's a transferase that actually groups the ATP and the monocleotides and it synthesizes NAD. This enzyme has been found in all the different organisms that we've actually looked for. It presents different variations. It conserves itself well in this catalytical center, but it has variations that allow to propose it as a diene for chemotherapy agents. The protozoariums like basal eukaryotes combine different characteristics of prokaryotes and eukaryotes. That's why it, despite having a, a large similitude in the catalytical centers, there are certain reasons or certain segments in the proteins that actually can be used for the diagnosis and for treatment. In this fashion, we have actually studied this and NAT, that central protein and synthesis, this has been one of the most studied on the group. We've studied all the parasites that I mentioned, and we've identified these enzymes. And likewise, we have also focused on other enzymes also related to the modification, like when we said that we actually used it as a precursor of molecules in the modification of proteins. For example, natkinasa or sirtuinas. And even in fact, when I did my introduction and I told you that we had parasites that were intracellular and extracellular parasites, we have also actually 
seeing how these parasites at an intracellular level, the simplification of the mechanisms of, gener of a generation is related with the appearance of transporters of NAD based on the host cell. This has allowed us to actually come up with an image of how it works or how those, those cell energy finances works in these protozoas. So what are the methodological strategies that we've developed? They're very simple, really. We, in principle, always have a strategy in an informatic fashion. And that bioinformatic approximation, we use computational tools that will allow us to optimize the use of resources. Remember that we're saying how to reduce the cost of research here, and we're trying to uh, streamline it. So the use of these tools, computational tools, provide us with predictions and models that help direct a little bit how we're going to experiment. The experimental approximation integrates molecular biology, microbiology, and biochemistry. There, the center of these experimental centers are two has two strategies in vitro studies in test tubes isolating proteins converting them no forgive me isolating the different systems producing proteins recombinant proteins setting them up or even producing antibodies to reach characterization and this is a central focus of this talk also Based on these informations, we have been able to come up with in vitro approximations, generating all of these informations to be able to have studies in situ about immunolocalization and immunoprecipitation and even generation of GMOs. And all of this that I talked about has been focused on generating and contributing to training, the training of our students, as well as the publication of articles, publishing of articles. I very quickly wanted to show you all how these approximations of bioinformatics, in this particular case, taken NMNAT. Look at the left side here of your screen. You can actually see, these are the crystallographic strategies of organisms where that are in the databases. So, using lining programs and using guideline programs and modeling programs, we were able to come up with the predictions of NMAT Brazilian one. A little, an article was published a while ago, but this is an enzyme that we love and that's why I wanted to show it here as an example. Look at here in the bottom right, um, highlighting the and MNAT of Homo sapiens, and look at the one of Lishmaishis. It's evident that in the red lines or in the blue lines, forgive me, you can actually see the conserved sites that are responsible for the catalytical activity, and this is maintained. Lishmania, with relation to the humans or the host, also present sectors that are completely different. They therefore are our blank. They are our objective. They are our target. And we have dedicated time to this characterization. The use of recombinants is in principle what has allowed us to actually come to this approximation. Look at the validity and how it's important. That extreme in this slide here shows in orange the lining of the creations of mutations. It actually showed us that it was essential for the functioning of the protein. Here you can also see how we express proteins, we purify them, and these recombinants can actually be studied in order to generate knowledge. We're actually revealing that metabolism in parasites. And these are the assays. And what I wanted to illustrate here, I was comparing the upper part, the native proteins. When I say recombinant protein, total recombinant proteins and mutated proteins, which we removed the segment, which is a special substance. And here you can see that we see disappearance here. This is a chromatogram of HTPL and you can see the disappearance of the synthesis. So that fragment, even though it did not define the catalytical center, it was specific to the parasites. It actually regulates or it truly is indispensable for its functioning. Here we see an example of another protein, cytoina, and how we've used it 
likewise to clone these, to express it, to purify. And via this, we have generated antibodies. So look here at this, at the usage here of our antibodies for immunolocalization of situina proteins, also that we've identified. Here you can see that we actually locate this. It's, so you can see the localization of this protein. So via this strategy, it has allowed us as a central point to generate certain experiences in a platform for the construction of expression vectors, for the expression of recombinant proteins and for generating antibodies. With this, we have actually generated lots of knowledge and a lot of training, important training for the scientific community. And here you can see some of these articles that were published and the training of students as well as those published articles are truly very valuable contributions and we're very happy with this. However, when we finish this work, when we actually work with these articles, we start to think and here we see the part of the reflections and how we help the community. How do we help our community? What are we contributing to for Colombia, for the country? What happens with those PhD theses, these master theses or those works of those young people that were trained and that actually know how to actually undertake these methodologies? Are they going into the job labor force? Are we actually having them included in the workforce at the service of our communities? Here, then there's, these are lots of questions and to, and then unfortunately I have to admit that this is, there's a vacuum here, there's a void here. This represents the missions and the, the, the university's vision, not only the national university, but in general, all universities. We, and I personally, as a professor, I see this as being isolated as two separate things. So research on one side, the generation of knowledge, teaching, training, education, and the extension was actually delayed. They didn't have, find their place in the workforce. That interaction with the community was actually not being met. So look at this, that the fact of having that little feeling that we should actually do something for the country. Uh, we have limited resources, obviously. So that led us to try to come up with ideas. What are we good at? What are we good at throughout time? And what have we become good at through experience? So we began to see that we combined all of these experience in molecular biology and microbiology and biochemistry, right? We became very good for designing and setting up certain vectors of creating these two, playing around with labels and the conditions of the constructions of these vectors. Likewise, for the productions of recombinant proteins and antibodies. Taking this into account and understanding what we're actually good for and how we can help the community, then we started to see what can we do to extend things. And when we checked the extension of the university disappeared, there's uh, service providers. The university provides services to educational communities, to the public sector, to the government, and to communities at a local level. But look here, the university, even though it's a central focus and with a generation of knowledge, tries to share. And I would say one way or another, tries to actually impose a little bit of what we generate in the university to those that surround us. And one way or another, that definition was a bit uh, poor for me and going more into depth, it's very good to sometimes stop and analyze our context, what's surrounding us. I didn't create this, it's simply what is actually moving the world. And I found a little bit of what we call inter holisticness, holisticness of the missions of the universities. And when we talk about holisticness, we talk about articulating the professors are teaching research and extensions programs, but that articulation requires reaccommodation, not as three different independent things that the extension is afterwards as something that is added. But look, the holisticness proposes that the community has to participate as an artifice of these processes as well, of research processes, as well as training and education processes. Holisticness 
makes education more inclusive because not only is the academic uh, world the ones that have the guidelines to teach, but we can actually have a dialogue, a sharing of knowledge with others, with corporations, private companies, with the communities, with institutions, NGOs, and governments, so that via dialogue, a unidirectional dialogue, we can truly respond to the most complex answers, answer them. As a researcher, I love parasites. I love protozoas. The goals that we have, our goals and objectives are clear, but Colombia, and in this time of pandemics, leads us to reflect upon this and think about it as we require some new things and requires our experience. So I invite us, not only for the university, but I invite companies to start to think about this model of actually looking at this in a more holistic fashion, an integrated cross-cutting fashion, because when we look at this in this fashion, in this way, then we will be resolving concrete real-world problems, problems that actually currently affect our communities, our local communities. Likewise, these problems that are going to be more complex will allow us to work in a more interdisciplinary fashion and an interdisciplinary approach will allow us as professionals not only to train ourselves and educate ourselves in that bubble called the university but rather we are educated in the work context that they're actually going to apply these knowledges to so my invitation is that we reflect upon the holistic nature of this. Based on this and taking this into account within the framework of a call for proposal three years ago before the pandemic, right? The university had a call for proposal called Sesqui Centenario. Our group actually launched a project that was called Reducing Research Costs in Colombia. In that project, we wanted to actually put at the disposition and avail make available to the scientific community our experience, our knowledge, our platform for producing recombinant proteins and antibodies for worldwide usage. It's true that the whole world can actually make recombinant, yes, but it's not so compli uh, complicated to make antibodies. But if everybody does it, then we're actually repeating processes and we're actually consuming and wasting resources worldwide. So we're talking about reducing the cost in Colombia. Uh, let's operate together, let's actually share. So I invite all of you, this is on the university website. If you actually look for the platform of production of recombinants and antibodies, you can actually see what we did via call for proposal, another call for proposals that we had for researchers. We were able to synthesize and produce four recombinant proteins and six antibodies of different origins for university groups. And not only from the national university, but from other universities as well, and also from the industry. It was a very beautiful experience. And not only did it allow us to feel that we can truly uh, do extension, let's not call it extension, let's say, let's say that we were able to project ourselves toward the community. And it also opened up cooperation possibilities and service possibilities. Service uh, it does not de divert to our research as investigators. They actually make things more agile and the processes become more agile at different levels. Very well, look here. I actually work with recombinant proteins in the context of parasites at the beginning of my talk. But here I want to actually highlight that recombinants are in everything. Recombinants are used and are the baseline for many, many in the clinics, for example, for the design of diagnostic kits, for treatment, for prophylaxis, many different drugs worldwide that are accepted are founded upon the use of recombinant uh, proteins. These recombinant uh, proteins, we in the labs can actually produce them based on coli, based on salivisis, uh, on yeast. And lately, we're actually, two years ago, we started to actually use clamidine mona rehaiti. This is an algae, a unicellular algae, a eukaryote that is very cheap and it produces proteins that have production capacities with advantage that is considered, according to the World Food Administration, PAO, is considered as a grass uh, organism. It doesn't cause any damage and actually is recommended uh, to be used in the diet. 
we've also been working on antibody production. We began producing polyclonal uh, antibodies in rats and in rabbits, but for 10 years, we stayed with antibodies in the poultry model. And in the poultry model allows us not only to produce high quantities of antibodies, but also due to the distance uh, with the mammal models, it has an antibody which is more diverse and it doesn't produce a cross reaction in the immune system of mammals. Every egg produces more or less 75 milligrams and an and a egg laying chicken can actually be active for at least a year. So a great production and tiplasis are stable, they're glycosylates. And something positive apart from this, that the system has is that it is not so invasive. You, ha you, you have to inoculate the chickens uh, naturally, but the antibody is also generated in the blood. It's obtained with a greater quantity and relatively pure with very simple methods of purification. We obtain these based on eggs. This technology or this, yeah, this technology for producing antibodies is used worldwide for developing and producing diagnosis and immunodetection for prophylaxis and also for treatment. In that context, look here, these are a few revisions which are relatively recent where they show us, like for example, for the diagnosis of parasite diseases, this is at a first level, all of these, what I just commented, earlier about producing these supplies and this information. But look at this, this is 2021 and this one is 2020. And in fact, Imano Globulina yesterday actually are being developed for treating, treating COVID. So they're, they're employed for immunization of Basile and for many other uses at a clinical perspective in Europe. In fact, for, for treating pseudomon, eikonosa, and kystic fibrosis, the treatment involves actually washing with solutions that have immunoglobulinas, polyimmunoglobulinas from eggs, from egg yolks. So, this basically wanted to present the potential that our group has via that platform for producing recombinants and antibodies. I want us to read this slide. I, uh, it makes a lot of sense to me, is that extensions are a public good. And this is capital that belongs to all of us. And this is an educational process that is just transformative where everyone learns and teaches at the same time. We seek to have a horizontal exchange between academic knowledge with the popular knowledge and we integrate and we try to generate communication and dialogue by at a bi-directional level where social actors participate jointly with universities in planning and in execution, as well as in the assessment of the processes. It is a process via which we try to solve the problems that society has. With this, I invite everyone to truly be generous. Let's be generous, all of us. Put to the side that uh, main character role and that selfishness that sometimes we have as researcher. Let's stop trying to reproduce everything at the same time in the different places. Let's recognize that not everyone can do everything or should do everything, but everyone can do something and do a part and we can do a lot more in that fashion. So it's important to create these networks. These networks not only will allow us to reduce costs, but these networks are truly generating spaces where our students can actually truly have better educations and where the resources that we actually have can actually be optimized. I believe that our country is more than ready for bioactives and generating bioactives. The fact is that we have to believe in ourselves. We have to actually put the cogs and the wheels together and communicate efficiently. If we are able to integrate all of these different components, then it is possible to at least develop diagnostic assays it's not so complicated as people may imagine. We have everything in, able to, in order to accomplish this. We have to trust in ourselves and we all, we have everything here. So this will have an impact not only in research, 
but also in clinical sectors, in agricultural sector, and in the food sector. Give me one second. I'm about to end. So naturally, I want to, to recognize some of the students that in the last few years have gone through the group because in them, not only do we have that desire that I've seen, I not only saw the desire for research or creating a thesis paper, but they also wanted to contribute to their communities to actually make a change. So to all of these students, I congratulate them because it was their questions that have led us to question ourselves and for our group to truly want to be active and project themselves into the community. Likewise, not only do I want to thank companies and institutes, but also to the different researcher groups. Colleagues, why don't you analyze and what you're good at? There are people that are excellent for clinical assays, and there are people that have a lot of expertise that they've developed and methodologies and strategies that they've developed that they've already created in their groups. We can actually not only for the specific interest of our models, but also for the interest of the country. It is our obligation to actually put our grain of salt to actually solve the sustainable development goals. And I think all of us can work on this. In order to end, this is a brief capsule. All of us can do something. So I invite all of you to download the app of the UN of the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, and read this and actually check it out of those 170 daily actions that we can actually do to transform the world. And I'm sure that little by little, we can truly accomplish things, not only to reduce the cost of research in Colombia, but also to truly do big things that will contribute to the development of our country. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much for that presentation and for those reflections that you have given us. It makes us think quite a bit and all the different entities that do research have to think about how we can serve our society better and to showcase what services the university can actually provide to generate these type of biomolecules that can actually be used for different fields and different applications. Professor. Due to time, we don't have enough time for Q&A, unfortunately, because the time went over. But let's continue with our next speaker. Thank you, Professor Maria Elena, for your contributions. Thank you to all of you. Thank you. So up next, we're going to continue with our agenda for the day. Up next, we have our third speaker, Professor Edbal Torsos. He is a neurochemical professor from Linchovitz in Switzerland University. He's currently a member of Traceability Education and Promotion for the Joint Committee of Traceability of Medicine and JCTLM Lab. He also represents Switzerland for Eurochem. He has training as a doctor from Iceland University. He has a PhD from the Kardiska Institute, and he's a specialist in chemical clinics from the Carolis uh, Hospital, and his main research interests are neuroendocrinologies, fibrobilators, and metrology. Professor Elbert Theoderson will talk uh, about traceability in clinical measurements. So now, up next, we're going to present... Dr. Elbar, the word is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, happy Metrology Day. I, it, it is difficult to discern between Sweden and, and uh, Switzerland. The main difference is that Sweden is in the far north. That's, that's uh, where I, I work and come from. Now, I, I want to share with you uh, experiences on the traceability in laboratory medicine. Physical metrology as we know it has its roots in the French Revolution, which emphasized the standardizations of the units for length and mass. Until recently, objects in platinum represented these units as objects that could be seen with the eye and felt with the hand. In contrast, Measurements in analytical chemistry and in laboratory medicine are commonly about measuring the concentrations of molecules 
that are present in very low concentrations like this one. Amongst a multitude of other molecules, many of which are present in much higher concentrations. Therefore, the two primary tasks are to visualize the presence and the concentration of the molecules of interest using physical methods, commonly the absorbance of light at specific wavelengths, and using selective chemical reactions to make sure that in practice only the molecules of interest are being measured. In laboratory medicine, the fundamental question is not primarily the measurement result, but rather whether the patient is healthy or not, or whether she is at, he or she is at risk, or, or whether she is sick, or whether she has been improved uh, by treatment or not. A major difference is also that the patient is a living dynamic organism with highly active biochemical, physiological and pathophysiological processes that can directly and indirectly change the measurement and the quantities associated with it. Both the chemical and physical methods used in laboratory medicine are subject to influences by other molecules in the sample that I mentioned before, and in the reference materials used. And these effects that not, are not due to the molecules of interest are called the matrix effects. So even though the chemical and physical method used cater for selectivity, they are both subject to additional influence factors that can lead to falsely high or falsely low concentrations of the measurements. Ultimately, it is therefore up to the healthcare professionals to use the measurement results together with the clinical information they have about the patient to make clinically relevant decisions. Now, measuring systems in laboratory medicine are designed for high throughput. This is just one example uh, that is working 24 seven in most laboratories. This is for immunochemical analysis and measuring more than 100 samples every hour. Uh, you see how, how miniaturized everything is. Every uh, measurement can be changed independently uh, in, in a highly sophisticated uh, way and most most of these methods are, are commercially available. Now, now to the traceability itself. This is an illustration of a general traceability a hierarchy for measuring glucose in a whole blood sample. You see it here, this blood drum. The upper half of the illustration lists a measuring system in the traceability chain and the lower half lists the reference material used to carry the value of an unbroken chain of reference measurements in the calibration hierarchy. Since the sample matrix, which I explained before, commonly influences measurement results in laboratory medicine, it is important that the matrix of the calibrator is as similar as possible to the matrix in the patient sample. That is the reason for this complex uh, uh, transfer of values. Traceability is a property of a measurement result that can be related to a reference through a documented unbroken chain of calibrations, each contributing to the measurement uncertainty. This is the real definition of traceability. Then the question is, what is then the reference? There are five options in laboratory medicine. It can be the, a definition of a SI unit. It can be a certified value of a reference material. It can be the result of a me reference measuring system, 
or the value assigned to an international conventional reference material, which I will explain later, or the values assigned to international harmonization reference material. However, it is very important to remember that traceability is not traceability to the producer of the reference material used for calibrating measuring systems or to internal or external quality control samples used in the measurement or to the manufacturers of reagent on measurement systems. So we cannot talk about traceability to NIST or LG or other producers. These, are, these five are the only options for creating traceability. Let us take an example. Uh, uh, and uh, that example is the T TSH, thyrotropin or thyroid stimulating, uh, stimulating hormone. The hypothalamus part of the brain controls the functions of the thyroid gland through the pituitary gland, uh, which uh, uh, produces the thyroid st stimulating hormone. And thyrotropin is a very complex molecule. It is, I, has a molecular weight of approximately 30 uh, kilodaltons and consists of two units, uh, subunits, the alpha and beta subunit. The beta subunit carries the TSH specific immunological and biological information, whereas the alpha chain carries the species specific information and has an identical amino acid sequence to the alpha chains of lutropin, folytropin, and gonadotropins. Now, the important part in, in our context here is that to make the TSH molecule, you need both selective enzymes that cleave the, the molecule to appropriate lengths, and also several glycosylation chains, which are all over the molecules. Uh, they consist of mannose, fucose, galatose, and sialic acids. And more importantly, major TSH molecules vary in their cont content of glycosylation molecules. And these modifications, they are hormone dependent, they change over the menstruation cycles, and they also, also change in, in sick people. TSH is very important because 10% of all persons above 30 years of age, especially women, have underproduction of, of thyroid uh, hormones. And, and this means that we, really need to be able to measure thyroid stimulating hormone. The problem is that uh, there is the, uh, when we are measuring, is the presence of matrix factors that I talked about. Since the molecules are often very varying in health and in disease, they cannot be produced in a pure form that can be weight. And therefore we have no traceability to SI. And there is also molecular uh, heterogeneity, uh, which I, I talked about earlier, especially glycosylation differences. And when we are using uh, antibodies to detect them, they bind to different epitopes in the molecule, and therefore they are at risk of producing different concentration results. Very often we do not know which molecules are most which part of the molecules are most medically uh, relevant and have the best diagnostic properties. And also, since they change, for example, over the uh, menstruation cycles, we do not, we, we, we are at a disadvantage in measure them, measuring them uh, properly. Um, and also there are interferences which are common in, in, in the samples like free hemoglobin, bilirubin, lipids, protein, and so on and so forth. All of this must take in, be taken into account. So uh, what we then need to do is to, to find out how we can standardize these substances in the best way. And today there are three basic methods 
that are used. The first method uh, provides traceability to the SSI units, uh, which is the highest um, uh, and best amount of, of uh, traceability. Now, the second method is traceability to international conventional reference materials. These are usually extracts of, of hormones from uh, uh, glands from, uh, from diseased persons, and they contain the mixture of the hormones that are naturally present in the human body. But sometimes neither the pure materials nor the uh, WHO reference materials are, are available, and the only material available are those that are produced by the producers of the measurement methods. But we need to have uh, methods to, to work with all of these, these um, uh, different uh, uh, traceability chains. Now, yes, last year, the ISO 17511 standard appeared. You see it is from 2020. And that is, uh, that is for uh, creating uh, such kinds of traceability. Now, it describes uh, six types of calibration hierarchies, of which the three first are, are the, uh, uh, those who go to, to SI. And the third one is for the uh, WH. Uh, the third and, uh, and fourth standard are to the WHO. And, and the rest are for harmonization. And let me explain to you a little bit more about what this is about. The first hierarchy is for measurement where both the primary reference material traceable to SI and also the reference measurement procedures available. And that is the case for electrolytes, glucose and steroids. The second one is for measurements defined by a reference measuring system but where no primary reference materials for the quantity traceable to assay is available. This is typical, for example, for enzyme, liver enzymes are, are typical. Uh, the third uh, calibration hierarchy is uh, for measurements defined by a reference measuring system, calibrate with a special uh, unique primary calib calibrator traceable to SI. An example of this is, for example, the uh, hemostatic factors. Now, the fourth one is for measurement where a certified reference material or an international conventional calibrator is available, but there is no reference measuring system. And TSH that I uh, mentioned before is a, is a typical example for, for this. And this is also the case for, for hormones. Now, the fifth one is for measurement for which there is neither a reference measuring system nor a certified reference material, nor uh, WH calibrators. Now, an example of this are, are the plasma proteins. And the last one uh, I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit uh, more about in the next slide uh, when I'm I'm uh, describing a new standard also, which came last year, uh, which uh, is called ISO 21151, which is uh, about in vitro diagnostic medical devices and requirement for international harmonization protocols. Now, what this is about is really when you don't have, when you don't have a, a calibrator that you can, can, can use, then you need to calibrate uh, each, ca each uh, producer calibrates in his own way with his own standard. And you see here four different measurement methods for the same measurement, for the same analyte. And these four producers wanted to make sure that they measure the same levels in the same samples. So they came together and they decided that to, to create a, um, an average line you see here by measuring 80 natural patient samples. 
and using deeming regression and analysis, uh, they, they could create a recalibration function for each of these measurement methods. So when you measure with this method, uh, the recalibration function will translate the result from the blue ones into this common, common result. And you will find how exactly how this all this is done in this new 21, uh, 151 standard, which will have a great impact, I'm sure, uh, uh, in the future. And this is an example of, of uh, the traceability uh, harmonizations, which is used in the uh, step four, five, and six that I show, showed you uh, before. Now, uh, when we are uh, analyzing samples from patient and we want to have good traceability, we, our traceability actually also rests on several pillars. We need to have commutable reference materials that behave as natural patient samples. We need to have reference measurement systems that are very accurate. We need to have network of reference measurement laboratories. So we measure the same levels in all the world. The manufacturers need to have good quality and need to collaborate. We need to have regulators in our countries that keep everything in line. We need to have laboratory quality systems and also trueness based proficiency testing systems. All of this is needed for traceability. However, traceability is not, not enough. We need healthcare personnel. Skill helper, if you use uh, medical tests for um, screening, as in this case, the uh, prevalence of the deceased is very low. This usually means that the risk of false positives and false negatives is high. And much higher than in a situation where the prevalence among the patient is higher. Healthcare personnel that use anamnesis symptoms and signs to select persons for testing that have the highest probability of disease increase very substantially the positive and negative predictive values of the test. Therefore, healthcare personnel are important. Now in my final slides, sound meteorological principles and practices are crucial for optimal diagnosis and treatment results. If metrology is suboptimal, it means that physicians and patients become confused. There is lack of trust, which means that tests are repeated when patients are moving between hospitals or treatment centers. Also, clinical guidelines become much, much less useful, and there may be suboptimal treatment and monitoring practices. In this example, uh, there is a positive bias of five units. And you see here, with the same decision limits, this bias will mean that a larger number of the healthy will be diagnosed as sick. And this is, of course, very detrimental in, in all treatments that, that the, all, and all diagnosis that the patient can have. Thank you very much for your attention. Muchas gracias, doctor. Thank you very much, Dr. Elver, related to your presentation about traceability. We have some time for one question. So doctor, in the case, there's many diagnostic kits. How do you regulate that all of them will have some sort of traceability at a metrology point of view? Is there any guideline to regulate them? Or in this case, what would you do? This is very much up to, to the regulators in your own country. There are quite different rules in the US, for example, compared to Europe, compared to Russia, compared to China. And, but all of these largest systems uh, uh, work rather well, but they work differently. 
Now, the, the part of the world which is most interested in traceability and therefore is having the best quality of laboratory diagnostics is China and Europe. Uh, the, the, um, America has ha very high quality in, in, in of course, in the, the, its biggest company and so on and so forth. But I believe that we need an international agreement on how to regulate medical diagnostics. And I, I believe that uh, since there are such large countries like China and India coming into this, that there will be a um, much better possibility to buy high quality diagnostics at a reasonable pr price in the near, very near future. And that they will be based on sound traceability principles. That is what I spend most of my time trying to accomplish. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Elbert. So thank you very much for your presentation. And I really thank you for having participated in World Metrology Day. And happy thank Metrology you. Day for you as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Vale, que estés muy bien. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much as well. So up next with our agenda, we're going to end with our last speaker, whom is John Emerson Leizamon. He is the director of the chemical bioanalysis. This is from the National Metrology Institute. He has experience in, in analysis, metrology, and nucleic acid validating assets, reference material production, and developing assays. He is a chemic, he has a master's in biochemical sciences in the National University. And since 2013, he's been a specialized professional in the Chemical Biology Metrology Center from the Columbia Metrology Institute. And since 2016, he works in the bioanalysis metrology section where he's focused on new measurement methods for the quantification of nucleic acids. So John, the word is yours. So, so you can share your presentation. Thank you very much for your participation today. Hello, Andres. Good afternoon to everyone. Can you see my slides? Yes, John. So give me a second. Great. So thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. For me, it's a pleasure to speak to you on the World Metrology Day about the activities that we have been performing at the Institute with the help of other entities and international help as well. Today, I wanted to talk about the aptitude assay that was done for detecting SARS-CoV-2 in Colombia. And what I basically want to mention is some of the historical perspectives that are a bit of general knowledge and that led to the development of these sciences and this trial or these tests or assays. As you know, in December of 2019, we see SARS-CoV-2 come into the scene. The first cases started to be reported in China, a disease or a new virus that produces the COVID-19 disease. And we have seen throughout this time how the scientific community has reacted very quickly, so much so that the genome of this new virus was sequenced very quickly. And in the first weeks of 2020, they began to develop the first assays with the purpose of establishing detection methods based on the virus's characteristics. And more particular, these were the first methods that were developed and they sought to identify specific sequences related to the virus's RNA. So the World Health Organization even published a group of protocols developed by certain of the organizations, a few of the organizations worldwide to help provide guidelines for countries in terms of detection methodology. So we see how China, the US, Charitin, and Germany, CDC in the US began to develop different protocols to detect the new virus based on the identification of different regions through related to the virus in February of 2020. 
the Food and Drug Administration in the US started to come out with emergency use in vitro usage for diagnostic usages. And this gave us the possibility to commercialize many assays or many tests, kits and diagnostics based on different properties. But here I wanted to call everybody's attention on the PCR test, which is the reference test. We're looking at a database of the several ones that have an inventory of different diagnostic methods reported that, for example, at, the, at date 5, 16 uh, PCRs were actually found in record in the whole world at that time. In March, it was also important to note that with the advances that we had with the increased amount of infections and the different numbers of fatalities that we saw, they declared the COVID-19 a pandemic in that same month. They detected the first case of COVID-19 in Colombia. And that's where the National Health Institute, which has already started to prepare ever since two months before, began to establish that network of diagnostic lab results for SARS-CoV-2, which is a expanded network to actually confront the virus and to expand the capacities for detection that they had at a national level. In terms of measurements, how do they work? Well, this is the structure of the virus. This is a virus that is basically composed of RNA and a layer of proteins, several which are used for detecting at a, at a linear level or a protein level. The reference method established is detecting nucleic acid. And basically what is done is that they take a sample where they presume that the virus is included. Since we're, we're interested in is analyzing the, the, the genome or the, the, the presence of the virus in certain regions, what we do is we extract and purify that genetic material of those nucleic acid that had that RNA. And then you have to go through a process to, conclare, to convert it into RNA. And then that DNA goes through a procedure, which is basically a thermal cycling that basically is a photocopy machine of DNA. What we're doing was we're amplifying a certain sequence. And what the labs are going to do basically is if they detect the sequence, then they're going to interpret this as a positive result. And there we have different sequences to identify. And if they don't identify anything, the interpretation is that it's a negative result. And that's the measurement criteria initially. So taking into account that we are entering a state where the virus is actually expanding quickly, there was many more commercial assays from commercial labs available that they began to have technical capacities and got approved, but not all labs were operating with the same procedures. And due to how critical it was to have measurement results, then the idea was how do we begin to support the regulatory figures and the vigilance, and vigilance areas to guarantee the reliability and, uh, of the results. So this project actually had that objective to strengthen the network of labs in the country that do diagnosis and for SARS-CoV-2 diagnosis because the reference method was RT-PCR RPCR using RTPCR via the development of insurance tools to make sure that we had get, uh, precision. So basically, the specific goals were on one side to produce a material, a reference material, which all labs would measure in a comparison uh, work between different labs. This is what we call a test kit and to ensure that it was adequate for a step purpose and to be actually employed by the labs in one way or another, be able to truly assess measurement capacities that different labs had. And the second purpose or second goal was basically to have an inter-laboratory inter work uh, up to two days where basically the national network labs were gonna participate to assess the detection capacities using the different methods that were being used in the different labs. This exercise obviously cannot be done alone. And we did it hand in hand with the National Health Institute and with the support uh, and international cooperation for quality and norms and uh, international standards. And I, uh, we did this with NIST and just, and 
the National Health Institute and INM, and this was free for the labs, it led to a greater scope and more reach. Now I want to talk about the activities for actually characterizing the reference material and then how we organize the aptitude test. In terms of characterization of reference material that was used as a test item, basically what we did was we took a material that was developed by NIST at a research level before, which is this material that is here, which basically contained the following. If this is the genome of the genome and the RNA, and we expanded this material, had two RNA materials, and here we can see the virus region. Obviously, one had a region close to uh, this region here, which is the red tube, and another is a fragment that contained this region. Why these regions? Because these are the regions at an RNA level where we have amplifications and detection and the greatest amount of methods for diagnosis that we had at the, up to that moment. So based on this information, what we did was to initially have a pilot program study, a small scale study to see how we can prepare the material, how we can characterize it to ensure that it was adequate to be used in an inter-lab exercise. So what we did basically was to take the material to prepare a stock of a certain determined quantity. And for this, we began to assess some of the PCR methodologies that we had available to characterize the materials. Then we did different levels of concentration and these lots were 20 units. And this was actually helping us do the study. Uh, and another blank had human RNA because the idea is that they used uh, an RNA to try to simulate a real sample. The idea is to employ samples to be as similar as possible to routine. So there was some RNA, human RNA didn't have the, and there was another blank that had another storage capacity. So with this, we prepared another panel, basically a package that it contained another sample of the different levels. Then what was developed was the characterization of that material. And what was done was to assess the, how homogeneous there it was that the property would be maintained in different units and each of the different levels that are prepared to guarantee that all the different labs would be measuring the same solution with the same values of the same properties. This was done with digital PCR and real PCR. And then we did stability studies. And then stability studies are going to see if we have a concentration of nucleic acids in different conditions. And we assessed at minus 70 and minus 20 and at 40 degrees Celsius to establish what would be the best conditions to transport and to store the material. Well, because thinking about aptitude tests, we would distribute that material in the different labs that were distributed throughout the whole country. And uh, we, we did this define that the material was homogeneous. And we did a quantitative and a qualitative study trying to ensure that the labs can actually assess their capacities for detecting different levels. And the study of stability found out that the material under the conditions that it was prepared was stable at four degrees, which was great because it helped with the logistics and conserving the samples and the transportation and the taking of samples, which would be very different if we would have to do it at minus 20 or minus 70 degrees Celsius would have been way more complicated. Based on this, then we proceeded to do preparation of an assay to send to the labs, obviously, we already found out the way to prepare and we determined if this material if it was prepared, it could have a stability for a month. And then from that point forward, we can continue to measure. So we began to do the preparation of the assays that were gonna be sent to the labs that would repeat the scheme, but expanding the quantity. So we prepared 200 units for each of these to set up 200 different panels. And then we did 
a more specific characterization to try to quantify each of the different levels that are positive. So we quantified them, we established the uncertainty levels, we characterized the responses that we expect to have for each of the different labs, for each of the different assays that were actually performed or could possibly be used in the future. So this was the presentation of the test item that was sent to the labs. It was a propylene vessel 500 that contained 80 microliters of solution and of each of the levels that were prepared. So we had the five different tubes and three device two negatives. And we packaged this in a plastic blister to guarantee the stability of the material. And then it was packaged into a plastic bag and then an aluminum bag. And then it was sent in a different, in a cooler to guarantee the transportation cold, being cold during the pilot program. So there we covered the first objective, which is to prepare an assay that would be adequate enough for labs in terms of the measurements that they were actually performing. And the second part, we have the organization of the aptitude tests, taking into account the RNA materials and taking in, considering the measurement processes that actually involve sampling, RNA extraction, RT, then PCR, and then analyzing the results. Basically, we see that the materials, when they started to measure, we began here, starting with RNA. And that doesn't have the extraction phase. The scope only talked about the measurement phases, and this was a qualitative test or assay. So obviously the labs have to say if it's negative or positive, is it there or not? However, they prepared different levels, trying to challenge the lab's capacity to ensure that they were there in different levels of concentrations, which is what can happen with an ordinary sample. Maybe you can have a high viral load or a lower viral load. So these are things that happen in the labs. After this, what was done was to establish an assay protocol, a test protocol, with how they prepare the material. Obviously, they didn't describe the concentrations nor the expected values, obviously, because that's what we wanted to assess that the labs would give us. But we did have to establish storage and transportation capacities and the performance of the labs. And these samples were distributed to a network of 124 labs, which were actually authorized at that particular moment to actually detect and diagnose in Colombia. The labs received their samples and what they did was to measure them with the measurement procedures that they would have implemented the tests that would have been developed by themselves as well as by the commercial that would be employed the commercial platform that they were working etc then they actually measured the samples based on the results they would determine if the sample was positive or negative and they would report those results and the assessment of the performance was done based on the concordance of the results that the labs obtained for each of the different samples that were coded with the, by the reference lab. So from the Institute, we also monitored all of this, monitored the material to guarantee that the material would actually conserve the values of the properties through time to guarantee that uh, the results and the interpretation that was done in a lab level would actually be in accordance with the performance of the laboratory and not related to the material losing uh, certain things. And the results that we obtained were very satisfactory. It allows us to obtain information that was complementary to what the National Institute of Health, National Health Institute already had in terms of the number of labs, in terms of the capacities for measurement that each lab had, in terms of the different platform that they used to measure, if they were open platforms or closed platforms, and it has to do much more with the automation and the capacity for processing samples. In terms of how many tests each laboratory are running, if they were measuring different regions in the genome, there were labs that only measured one, or there were some that measured two, or some even measured three different sequences. And for labs, that had certain problems with some of the samples, then we have to try to find out what was the cause for sample false negatives. So those that were positive, but the lab said they were negative, especially those that had very low concentration, which were concentrations that were very close to the detection limits and false positives. So they show negatives that are actually shown as positive because maybe they contaminated the samples or simply not reported samples. Likewise, the idea was to compare instrumental responses for the labs in terms of those that we had for references and actually try to see what coherence existed between the labs, which was great. 
and we observed that there were certain values that were outside of the tendency, but in general, the general population was within the expected values. So basically those were the general results of the labs. The labs had a good performance. In fact, that was a great news for us. So what were the conclusions that we have based on this exercise? Well, globalization, we're in the era of globalization basically and measurements are very involved in globalizations. And we see that these types of activities truly allow us to work in a collaborative fashion with different entities and generate capacity synergies. It's very difficult right now that just one entity, as Nacha said before, that they would have all of the infrastructure, all of the conditions. What you have to do basically is try to actually group together amongst different entities to improve the capacities of the country as a whole. And this allows us to respond in a timely fashion all the different needs that are identified, like in this case, trying to support the activities that are being developed in the country to detect SARS-CoV-2. And based on the results that we obtained with the National Health Institute, we decided to determine what activities can be done in order to strengthen this network of labs. This is also an exercise that is not only related to strengthening the rest, but also see what other capacities exist for these entities to try to support these peoples or the communities in a better fashion and cater to the needs of the labs at the same time. And lastly, it allowed us to provide validity tools that are external to the labs as well, which is an advantage for them really, because apart from their procedures, uh, Q and A, Q quality insurance on external tools and on objective tools allows us to have more trust in the results and in the measurements that are done based on these results. Well, basically that was the exercise that we did. And here I have to actually give my gratitude to all the people that participated in this project from the National Health Institute, from NIST, from the Chemical Quality Program, from the Metrology Costa Rica Institute, and obviously from the National Metrology Institute in Colombia. That was my talk. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you, John Emerson. Thank you very much for your presentation and how, uh, how the Institute responded to the pandemic by developing these types of tests and assays. John, there are questions related to the exercise. One is how different uh, the aptitude, what are the differences between aptitude? Well, that was part of the, the capacities or the training that we're actually working on right now. At this particular moment, when we have a sample from a patient, the first thing we do is we have the extraction phase. When we have open and closed platforms, and the closed platforms are those that, what they do is they take the sample, they insert it into a cassette, it goes to the equipment, and the equipment does the extraction, the purification, the PCR, et cetera, and at the end, they report the results. These open platforms, what they do is, what the majority do is they extract on one side, and then they have an RNA solution, and then that RNA is put into a second part, which is the restriction and the PCR, basically, that's where we have the assay of that item. So it would be very similar to those samples once we have the extraction of the RNA. And so simply didn't cover it because the material was based on RNA. So if you look at the measurement system, it's very simpler because the RNA is what is being used, which has already been extracted. So thinking about this and the conclusions that I was mentioning earlier, what are the capacities that we need or skills? Well, thinking about a second round of this exercise, well, we're working on material that can actually cover the extraction phase and part of the improvement activities that we're doing with this exercise. Thank you very much, John. And here we see another question. This aptitude assay can be used for quick tests for uh, nucleic acid. Yes, of course it works. At the end of the day, what are these things doing? These are tests or assays that are isothermic. And what they do is they take nucleic acid and they go through the amplification process under the conditions that are optimized. At the end of the day, the item of the test like this one that is done would be adequate because at the end of the day, it has the RNA, which is the main thing for the test. So it can be used. 
y digamos teniendo en cuenta los resultados del considering the results of the aptitude test what did you do with the labs that did not actually meet the standards or they did not have satisfactory results well as i told you earlier uh, told you earlier we work together with the national health institute which are the ones that are in charge of coordinating that network of labs it's the entity that does the oversight for the labs as well so what we do is basically is we execute the aptitude test we have we publish a report and with them we work with the health institute to begin to strengthen these uh and improve these entities in reality very few labs obtained a negative result as such it was only like one or two and they sometimes didn't fill out one or two things but then for those labs what we're doing is another activity to begin to verify the borders of the or the limits between the method with the national health institute in coordination with them thank you very much i think uh that was the last presentation thank you john emerson for this presentation of how the national uh metrology institute and the national health institute responded to the pandemic and its aptitude test and the metrology session for chemist for the chemistry room is officially over but i wanted to remind everyone that the, the close of the event is going to be done in the main auditorium in the main zoom room so all in the main audit so all of you go to the main auditorium and continue with the event tomorrow for the world metrology day celebration thank you very much to all of you